My Landlord I had a landlord around that time who had been president of a local biker gang. My wife, Tammy, and I lived next door to him in his parents' small apartment building. His girlfriend bore the marks of self-inflicted injuries characteristic of borderline personality disorder. She killed herself while we lived there. Dennis, large, strong, French-Canadian with a gray beard, was a gifted amateur electrician. He had some artistic talent, too, and was supporting himself making laminated wood posters with custom neon lights. He was trying to stay sober after being released from jail. Still, every month or so, he would disappear on a days-long bender. He was one of those men who have a miraculous capacity for alcohol. He could drink 50 or 60 beer in in a two-day binge and remain standing the whole time. This may seem hard to believe, but it's true. I was doing research on familial alcoholism at the time, and it was not rare for my subjects to report their father's habitual consumption of 40 ounces of vodka a day. These patriarchs would buy one bottle every afternoon, Monday through Friday, and then two on Saturday to tide them over through the Sunday liquor store closure. Dennis had a little dog. Sometimes, Tammy and I would hear Dennis and the dog out in the backyard at four in the morning during one of Dennis's marathon drinking sessions, both of them howling madly at the moon. Now and then, on occasions like that, Dennis would drink up every cent he had saved. Then he would show up at our apartment. We would hear a knock at night. Dennis would be at the door swaying precipitously, upright, and miraculously conscious. He would be standing there, toaster, microwave, or poster in hand. He wanted to sell these to me so he could keep on drinking. I bought a few things like this, pretending that I was being charitable. Eventually, Tammy convinced me that I couldn't do it anymore. It made her nervous and it was bad for Dennis, whom she liked. Reasonable and even necessary as her request was, it still placed me in a tricky position. What do you say to a severely intoxicated, violence-prone ex-biker gang president with patchy English when he tries to sell his microwave to you at your open door at two in the morning? This was a question even more difficult than those presented by the institutionalized patient or the paranoid flayer. But the answer was the same. The truth. But you bloody well better know what the truth is. Dennis knocked again soon after my wife and I had talked. He looked at me in the direct, skeptical, narrow-eyed manner characteristic of the tough, heavy-drinking man who is no stranger to trouble. That look means, prove your innocence. Weaving slightly back and forth, he asked, politely, if I might be interested in purchasing his toaster. I rid myself to the bottom of my soul of primate dominance motivations and moral superiority. I told him, as directly and carefully as I could, that I would not. I was playing no tricks. In that moment, I wasn't an educated, anglophone, fortunate, upwardly mobile young man. He wasn't an ex-con Quebecois biker with a blood alcohol level of .24. No, we were two men of goodwill, trying to help each other out in our common struggle to do the right thing. I said that he had told me he was trying to quit drinking. I said that it would not be good for him if I provided him with more money. I said that he made Tammy, whom he respected, nervous when he came over so drunk and so late and tried to sell me things. He glared seriously at me without speaking for about 15 seconds. That was pretty long enough. He was watching, I knew, for any micro-expression revealing sarcasm, deceit, contempt, or self-congratulation but I had thought it through carefully, and I had only said things I truly meant. I had chosen my words carefully, traversing a treacherous swamp, feeling out a partially submerged stone path. Dennis turned and left. Not only that, he remembered our conversation, despite his state of professional level intoxication. He didn't try to sell me anything again. Our relationship, which was quite good, given the great cultural gaps between us, became even more solid. Taking the easy way out or telling the truth, those are not merely two different choices. They are different pathways through life. They are utterly different ways of existing. 